happening now. We'd like to welcome our viewers from across North America, around the world, and maybe even beyond planet Earth. This is the EdTech Situation Room for December the 6th, 2017. I am Wes Fryer, your host and guest and whatever person on this, this end of the talk from Oklahoma City, and very excited to have a chance to, as we do on a weekly basis to break down ed tech news from an educational lens. Joined as always by my superior, the, the superior intellect in this show for sure, Jason Neifer from Missoula, Montana. Jason, is the winter weather in the air in Missoula tonight? It's definitely in the air. What it isn't is on the ground. So we really haven't had a whole lot of snow yet. Uh, there's been a, a, some threats of it, and I've been keeping an eye on weather as I plan on doing a little bit of traveling at the end of next week. And so far, other than coal, that's about as far as it's going to get. So, of course, the, the question for every Montana at this time of year is, will we have a white Christmas or not? And so we will keep our eyes to the sky to see if little white flakes uh, fall from the sky to cover the ground before Christmas. But I can say our holiday lights are up outside of our home. Um, we put up a little tree this year, which sometimes we do and sometimes we don't, um, and uh, we're ready for the holiday season. How is the preparations going in your neck of the woods, sir? Well, I was able to, to hang uh, holiday lights with the help of my wife in 72 degree warm weather on Saturday. So uh, it is cooler. We did get a, a cold front, I think, like Monday night, Tuesday. So it does feel a bit more wintry, but uh, boy, I'm sure thankful not to be in California, uh, seriously, folks, we're really not a weather show, even though we, you know, we have to have some kind of little branter at the beginning to get started. But holy cows, like yesterday was 125,000 people evacuated. And this yeah. today was in Bel Air and thinking about Montana with your fire season. So uh, if we could only send the snows to LA, but um, it, anyway, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to it. We've, and, and it's definitely like, we may not weather-wise be feeling like Christmas, but we had our uh, school-wide faculty staff Christmas party tonight, and tomorrow night's the trustees Christmas party that I get to to be uh, there, probably providing some AV support for a video that they'll play, and and then my wife has her lower division or elementary party on Friday, so it is like bam, 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 you know, welcome to the time of grazing and enjoying <laughs> lots of, uh, you know, appetizing snack treats. Sure. There you go. All right. Well, we are the EdTech Situation Room. We gather together on Wednesday nights to break down technology news. And uh, we've got, as we typically have now, a good lineup of, uh, of, of articles. So, Jason, where would you like to start us tonight? Well, um, I want to pick up a link that we uh, didn't pick up on last week, and it's funny because I, I, I told myself I definitely want to discuss this one with Wes, and then uh, we got going on other stuff last week and didn't do it. Uh, I found something interesting a couple of weeks ago that is a set of security guidelines for congressional campaigns, and this is from a web, web resource called techsolidarity.org, and basically this is the advice that they give to fledgling congressional campaigns um, that are starting to put uh, technology into their campaign systems in order to help run a campaign for election to the United States Congress. And what's, what's really interesting about this to me is that it's obviously very security focused and the document itself mentions uh, 2016 and the exposure that a lot of campaigns nationwide and in, in congressional districts faced with hacks that have gone on. And um, there, there were a couple pieces of advice there that I thought were interesting that I kind of want to run past you. The first one, Wes, and as a tech director, I thought you'd probably have some thoughts about this. Um, they advise not utilizing antivirus software, which is the first time I've seen in a formal set of recommendations to not use antivirus software. What's interesting is that if you go on to some of the other uh, hard tech focused podcast. The one I've been thinking about, Leo Laporte on the Twit Network, uh, said something like this about six weeks ago on one of his shows, that he no longer installs antivirus software and relies on the fact that Mac generally doesn't get viruses and the fact that PCs with Windows 10 have an integrated antivirus. Um, but they echo that to say that it is no longer the recommendation of security experts as it relates to political campaigns to install antivirus software. So Wes, do you have any reaction or thoughts about that? 
I have read this as well. Um, we have to remember that security is always an in-depth thing, that there's not like one level of security that keeps us safe. So whether you're talking about the network or your house or your own personal information, um, I, you know, in the context of what we have talked about on the show with Kaspersky and how whether you buy that it was the CIA that was saying they were Kaspersky doing things or it was Kaspersky themselves, the deep scanning that they were doing and then the sharing of that deep scanning was making folks very vulnerable to attack and people being able to have a, you know, basically great inventory of what was on their machine and, you know, then being able to, to, to make them. I, I don't know. I, with my Android phone, um, have have installed and, and played with some tools that uh, purport to be, you know, anti malware. Um, I, I I guess I do see this coming. I think that the the clean refresh and the clean install is going to be one of our best um, safeguards against this. Right, being able to pull down a fresh, clean version of whatever operating system you're running on your mobile device or your your laptop, your device. And so, but it's it's pretty fascinating. Um, it it just you know it's kind of like in this era of fake news or whatever. You know, who do you trust? And to be able to say, well, now we don't even you know trust the the antivirus folks. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sold on that position to the point where I'm ready to tell my teachers that, but it's pretty, pretty interesting, especially when you, you know, hear folks like the, the Twit Network and respected voices, right, saying this, because that, that's something we run into on the show too, probably on a weekly basis. We're like, and from the, uh, you know, news obscura that you've never heard of before, it's like, well, who wrote that or, or whatever? And that, it, that speaks to the importance of trusted voices and, and the dynamic nature of technology and where we're at. So I, I think I'm going to be, you know, probably tuning into security now, which is one of the great Twit Network network podcast that discusses this and then learning more about it. Be but because I think from a school perspective, one of the things that we are working to implement this year that we haven't done rigorously is ensuring that everyone has their machine re-imaged on a regular basis because we have not done that. And some people have been seriously like four different major operating system updates, you know, behind, and that puts themselves and, and everybody behind. I will say that this coming Tuesday is the deadline for our faculty and staff to all be on two-step, and I have been tracking that and auditing our faculty staff email accounts, and, you know, that's that's one thing that we are, are doing to try to address security issues. But do you see yourself, Jason, giving people advice either on a personal level or do you run antivirus, by the way? Because I just put it, I put Bitdefender on all the Macs last Christmas for our family. And that was the first time I had done that. Yeah, I I do run, I don't run it on on, on Mac. I, I, I did five or six years ago and found that it was oftentimes the most unstable thing on my system was the antivirus, including I think at one point I had paid for a commercial version of an antivirus software for Mac. Um, PC is a bit of a different game for me because I, I, I do know the statistics that say that, that the vast majority of, of malware and virus attacks are aimed at Windows operating systems. But something that I found to be true in Windows 10 is that it seems like the Defender antivirus that's built into Windows 10 is good enough uh, to, to, to you know, save me from, from any of those things. I will say that um, in the, I guess, 25 plus years I've been computing, um, most of that time I have had antivirus software on my machines and I only was impacted or had something sniffed out just once in 25 years. Um, and I think it's not because uh, the antivirus didn't catch it, it's because I'm, I'm very, very careful about that. Um, I, I, two things related to that. First, there is a lot of conversations going on in school districts, and I know this conversation is happening right now amongst tech directors in Montana because a lot of the free antivirus vendors, those that, that gave away a version of antivirus um, only to try to upsell you to a better or more full-featured version, a lot of those folks are getting rid of the free licensing, and some of them are also not allowing schools to take advantage of the free licensing, considering them a commercial enterprise for the purposes of licensing. And that's led to a lot of discussion about where to go with that. 
that. And it can be a very expensive venture for even a small school district to put um, a yearly uh, or regularly updated antivirus software on PCs. It's a, a very expensive proposition. And I, I certainly I agree with you, Wes. I'm not even close to telling people not to have antivirus software. Um, you know, there are, are decent um, alternatives available. Um, Avast comes to mind, ABG comes to mind. I think those are the same company now. And then um, I think it's Avira is the name of the one that uh, Lifehacker recommends amongst the free antivirus products. But the bottom line is, is that, you know, we still live in a pretty dangerous world. Um, the second thing I, I wanna also mention is that in the article itself, it talks about Chromebooks as being a kind of an ideal situation for campaigns because they don't have a ton of malware in the or malware attacks in them. And that, you know, also you can safely delete the machine or reboot the machine and the data gets wiped off of there pretty easily. And so I thought it was very interesting that they're aware of kind of the Chromebook phenomenon in those campaigns and, and how great that can be um, for machines. Um, speaking, uh, one side note related to that is that, you know, Wes, your recommendation to have a, a, an, a machine re-imaged all the time, first of all, is part of the reason why the Chromebook is so powerful, because within just seconds, you can reboot a machine and have it start fresh with a new operating system. But I can say that, and I don't care if I'm on a Mac or a PC, I regularly wipe my machine and start over again. And it's a lot easier in 2017 than it was say in you know 2002 to do that because all I need to do now is usually download one or two commercial things. Um, I have a great piece of software I use on the PC called Nanite, N-I-N-I-T-E, which allows you to automatically install up to 45 different free applications. So I can just go there, click the ones that I want and it'll automatically download and install them. It's a great piece of software. Um, and look at Wes checking that out. Um, and, um, and, and after I install Office, I can just download, you know, Google Drive and it, you know, reconstitutes my entire file system there, um, you know, automatically backed up to the cloud. So I do that pretty frequently. I would say um, if I'm constantly using a PC, I would every six to eight months nuke it and start over again. Um, and um, I think I showed Wes something interesting tonight, but it's a, it's a pretty great pretty great piece of software, but um, it, it, you know, it allows me to do that. And I think that it, it's good for malware purposes, but to be honest, I feel like Windows degrades over time. And I do less so with, with Mac OS, but I found the same experience with Mac OS. So, you know, as a security procedure, but also as kind of a cleaning feature, I think it's good to nuke and start over again pretty, pretty frequently. Have have you heard of folks using that Nanite um, on an enterprise level? You know, at school. I'm pretty sure you can put it like in a startup batch file, and it will not only install apps, it will update them to the latest version if you run it again later. So there might be something wow. there for you. So yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah, definitely. So I, I added that as a secondary geek of the week uh, there under your. Yeah, pretty great stuff. Okay, well, very cool. Wow. All right, well, I'd like to jump to a just wildly futuristic article um, that I have uh, I've just been reading through, and I, I put a couple quotes, uh, which I don't normally do, into the uh, show notes, which, by the way, you can find at edtechsr.com slash links. And <clears throat> generally, on the regular podcast post, we will just have our links in a relatively sequential order that we talked about. But this is from the MIT Technology Review, November 30th. The surgeon who wants to connect you to the internet with a brain implant. And we are not, I, my foil hat, I think, was thrown away by my wife. So I, we're not talking about stuff that is just outlandish. This, this is actually a brain surgeon who is legit. And um, he's saying the, the following things. A true fluid neural integration, meaning an integration between our brain and between computers to be able to control computers and, and receive input, um, is going to happen, Luthart says. It's just a matter of when. If it's 10 or 100 years in the grand scheme of things, it's a material development in the course of history. And the, he's talking about a future where 
basically every you know a lot of people not everybody of course but a lot of folks are going to choose to have an implant to become augmented we've talked about this on the show before you know part of what happens sometimes when we don't have our phone with us and we you know walk out of the house and we're like oh my gosh i don't have my phone you kind of feel incomplete or naked you're like what you know where is it you know our brains today are very much becoming augmented because the landscape of thoughts that we have is highly influenced by the text messages and the emails and the social media posts and all of these inputs that we're receiving. And so he is saying now with sufficient funding today, um, he can create a prosthetic implant for the general market that would allow someone to use a computer and control a cursor in three-dimensional space. And I think we've probably shared some articles like, like, this on the show before because especially like folks that are paralyzed and people who have different kinds of disabilities right this then this kind of article um you know what challenges us to walk the line between wow that's really cool and amazing and oh my gosh i'm creeped out and that's like a totally you know freaky thing that i would never want to have happen but when it comes to to like folks with disabilities whether that's from birth or because of an injury or you know uh, trauma suffered because of because of some kind of an accident it says users could do things today this is today's ability to turn lights on or off turn the heat up and down using their thoughts alone they might even be able to experience artificially induced tactile sensations and access some rudimentary means of turning imagined speech into text. With current technology, the brain surgeon says, I could make an implant, but how many people are going to want that now? I think it's very important to take practical, short interval steps to get people moving along the pathway towards this um, road of long-term vision. So his company that he's founded is called Neurolutions, and I've, uh, I'll put the link into the show notes. I've got it there. We've mentioned Elon Musk among his other you know, enterprises besides Tesla and SpaceX and SolarCity has, uh, and OpenAI, which is pretty important, trying to allow artificial intelligence to be you know, openly accessible, not just controlled by a few companies or, or governments. Um, Musk's company that is doing this is called Neuralink. And again, we are not talking about science fiction. Like if you'd love some awesome STEM related writing prompts for your kids, which by the way, we haven't fleshed that out as a part on the, on the website, you know, this is just, this is so awesome. Um, and then the last little paragraph I put in here talks about stroke victims and uh, what he, what he is developing right now. They've raised several million dollars for this um, brain monitoring electrodes that sit on the scalp and are attached to an arm or orothesis and can detect a neural signature um, from the brain. And what's, what's amazing about this is we're talking about harnessing pattern recognition that can be done with AI and with, with machine learning. And, and what we're talking about is actually reading thoughts, right? And this is this, this both dream and perhaps nightmare where, you know, I can put this helmet on and, you know, you can read my thoughts or I could be dreaming at night and then you could see my dreams and what I'm thinking. And so they're actually doing experiments where um, in some cases, these are, are epileptic patients who are sitting and waiting for, you know, a seizure and they're receiving treatments and things like that. And they've agreed to participate in some experiments where they're verbalizing things and then they're simply thinking the same thing. And so the computer and the electrodes are sensing those things. And it's, it's really, there was a National Geographic article perhaps in the last year, or maybe it was two, but it was in the last year, I think, where it was talking about the state of brain research and how we're still very much like a satellite that is looking at the earth and looking at clouds and detecting patterns, but not really seeing, you know, people on the ground and that granular level of what's happening, like at a neurotransmitter level inside the brain. So anyway, this is freaking amazing. I think that one of the implications is I mean, we got to get kids excited about biology, right? You know, if truck driving is not going to be a job, and I'm not saying that people who are truck drivers are going to get retrained to, you know, do neuro, you know, neurobiology and everything, but but this is um, this is exciting stuff that's not quite science fiction. So the question is, Jason, as you like to say, the bottom line: Are you going to sign up for the implant, and what would you like the implant to do? 
<laughs> well, I mean, I, I think of it in terms of like the matrix, right? That, that, that looked at a kind of dystopian future where you could plug in skill sets and suddenly, you, you know, I know Kung Fu and that sort of thing, right? But um, I, it, it's got a, a practical application to something I've been thinking a lot about. So um, I haven't talked a lot about my dissertation um, on, or the topic of my dissertation on the show, because partly because I've been kind of keeping it under wraps, I will say that it has a, a bit to do with intelligent personal assistance. And one of the things that has been on my mind about this, and I've ran into a lot of research about this when I was writing my review of literature, is that one of the things I've always disagreed with people that say we could replace textbooks with a Google search or why teach facts when kids have Google searches available to them. I've always found that to be kind of intellectually suspect because a lot of times, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And so setting kids free to Google without even the basic foundation of understanding something is, is a very dangerous learning strategy, right? Like I'm not saying that you can't teach yourself a lot if, if you know the internet, but uh, for the vast majority of students in the vast majority of circumstances, you know, we need to give them a foundation of knowledge before they're allowed to go freely learn on their own the internet. Well, there's some researchers in Scandinavia that are looking at the notion of uh, virtual personal assistance from the standpoint of what if it could teach you based on what you didn't know as you were plowing through and trying to create facts, right? So in other words, when I'm trying to understand something, if, it, if it's neurologically connected to you and it knows that you don't know, so it can provide you a really, really, really um, direct um, uh, application of that knowledge. In other words, it scales back the, the website, the, the information stream, whatever it looks like to teach you what you need to know to make sense of those pieces, right? So it's dynamically learning with you as it's kind of connected to, you, to your uh, neurological system, I think there's a lot of potential power in there. And they were talking about it in context of highly technical jobs, right? Like if you're doing something where you're trying to create create based on something you maybe don't have a 100% knowledge or understanding of, there's very much a scenario where that could be uh, dangerous unless you have something that's basically stopping, slowing up, slowing down, speeding up based on what your intellectual needs are. And so that, that to me, what you're talking about, Wes, is the, you know, kind of intellectual uh, precursor to that happening, right? Like if we have something that's able to neurologic connect, um, you know, that, that is the, the, hardware notion of what that software could then provide. Now, of course, you know, we are in 2017, futuristic articles, articles sound a little scarier now that we've been through the last 18 or so months with, you know, social media being tweaked to deliver sad or bad messages and yada, yada, yada. But it's certainly something that was, I think, is inevitable, right? Like, it's not something we're we're going to be able to avoid. There's always going to be an attempt to kind of fuse the biological and the, and the um, uh, uh, I guess you would call it, digital. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And in the article, they talk about, you know, how the uh, computing power and contents of today's cell phone, you know, in... 10 years, certainly 20 years, maybe sooner, you know, is going to be able to go on a grain of rice. So the ability to have that, that kind of, and even more, you know, computing power in your brain and being augmented. I mean, it, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty wild. Um, I think, I mean, for my, for my own kids and just thinking about school, I mean, we, yeah, we just, we need, we need to, to try to open up doors for kids to think about careers. Uh, in fact, I don't think I've got this one in the show notes yet, but there was a, an article about myths of STEM, you know, as if like every job, if you do anything with STEM, you're going to have amazing, you know, career potential earnings. And it's, it's not going to be quite that simple. Um, we do need to be thinking about uh, career fields and, and jobs and, and ways of making money that's going to, you know, continue as all. And continues to march forward. So anyway, I would love to hear other other folks' feedback about that. And I I do think I want to flesh out something about writing problems, right? Because there's, I mean, some of the stuff we talk about is just kind of cool. And it's like, wow, you know, I like, I like to learn about the future. I'm awed by that sort of thing. Um, but there's some really practical, you have kids learning to write and learning to research and, and uh, doing that all the time. So I think there's a uh, a, an, a, an application here where you know we could have some kids doing some interesting writing prompts based upon some of the, the more interesting 
articles and things like that that we end up discussing. So where shall we go next, Commander Jason? Let's, let's do a quick Microsoft thing, because I think this is potentially very interesting. Um, the Verge reported this morning, and uh, Wired picked up on the story that Microsoft is about to release its first, well, it's not its first, but its most recent attempt at ARM based processor laptops. And um, for those of you unaware of the kind of competing uh, uh, architectures for uh, uh, chipsets, um, Intel is the traditional chipset where uh, some people call it Wintel, Windows and Intel, though Intel now runs Mac as well. And they are a, a chipset that really has, you know, 30 years of history. And if you've heard of an i5 chip, an i3 chip, an i7 chip, those are all Intel chips. And Intel chips are, have a lot of raw power to them. The downfall to them is they are terrible with battery. And even though um, Intel keeps making strides in that arena, for example, um, I have a, a, a Chromebook that has a, an M7 chip in it, which is a, a, the kind of their i7 chip for, for super mobile devices. It The reason why that Chromebook gets awesome battery life is because it has um, you know a scaled back chip in it that is more power efficient. Well, uh, Microsoft has been working on a project for the last, uh, my understanding is about two years, to introduce full-blown Windows in an ARM chipset. And the ARM chipset uh, runs a lot of Chromebooks. Uh, Chromebooks that get long battery life oftentimes have ARM chipsets. They're also super cheap chipsets as well. It's also the same uh, chipset that runs your cell phone. And so, um, as an example, um, I use an Android phone, even if you're using an iOS uh, phone, that's an ARM-based processor that's developed by Apple and licensed to the people that, that, that uh, license ARM. It's the reason why cell phones get great battery life is because they're using those scaled back ARM chipsets, even if you take a speed hit. Well, Microsoft is now releasing um, a set of laptops from various vendors that are ARM-based, and they're promising 20 hours of battery life even with full-blown Windows that runs all of the Windows software. Um, my understanding from some articles over the past year that, that Microsoft does face some challenges here because Intel believes that some of their intellectual property might be lifted by the code that Microsoft is running um, to it kind of emulate that, that Intel environment. But the notion of a 20-hour uh, Windows laptop is extraordinary to me and could be interesting things to come. And I think makes, um, especially if it ends up being a low uh, or low cost laptop, assuming that speed is acceptable, um, you know, that's ARM is also a low cost chipset as well. It could introduce all sorts of interesting things. Um, and so for me, it's a couple things. First, obviously, it's you know great that they're innovating in the space, but um, I, I, I've I never owned a single device minus maybe the iPad where I've been satisfied with the battery uh, life, period. The iPad battery, for some reason, is epically amazing, like really smart. Um, but, you know, I, I'm constantly thinking about battery packs, like I, for my USB-C laptop and phone devices now, I, I this is a an Anchor uh, USB-C 20,000 milliamp hour battery. It weighs 175 pounds. Um, it could kill someone, so it's a weapon too. But, you know, I think constantly about keeping my devices powered up and strategies for doing so. But in a world where a laptop gets 20 hours, I mean, that's a couple of days of work before I think about charging it. So are you by chance excited, sir, about the prospect of that? Absolutely. And I would say, you know, what I've what I've ended up doing because of the Egypt trip, uh, switching over to this, you know, Android Motorola uh, G4 plus phone with a 5000 milliamp battery. I, I never run out of battery juice. I, I never worry about that during the day. That is a game changer. And, you know, for me in Egypt, because I took a Chromebook as my my primary yeah. I, I didn't need to worry about charging. I actually didn't have the power adapter, the converter. I had the adapter, but not the converter to Egyptian you know, power grid. No problem. Didn't need it because I was not going to run out of juice on that Chromebook. So I don't think that's a transformative thing to just be like, oh my gosh, computing in school is never going to be the same. But it's a big deal. And as we you know talk about perhaps some pathways with one-to-one -one at our school and we're having different conversations, you know, um, changing people's behavior as far as charging devices, remembering power chargers, 
you know, having spare chargers, all that is, is a pretty big thing. And, and I'd say that also, you know, I'm, I'm using my wife's MacBook air to, to do the show. And, uh, part of that is just, you know, the speed, it's an I seven processor. I had a, a few, you know, situations where this, I think this is a, um, a, an Apple, I want to say it's an A7. It's like, I think it's the, the fourth generation iPad. It's the equivalent processor that's in here. This is the the thin, thin MacBook. Um, you know, Apple has been experimenting in this area as well. This, this is part of what's happening with Moore's Laws. We're getting so much computational power that we don't all need to go to the next best, fastest processor because, hey, guess what? Most of what we do is pretty browser-based. It's not uber processor intensive. What we're doing right now with video in this show is probably the most you know, processor intensive activity that I do and that that system can handle it. But I'm I'm very excited about that. And I would also add to this that I think all of us in schools need to be thinking beyond one to one, right? Because today we are living in a multi-device world where probably every single person listening or watching this show, and I'm sure there's thousands of you out there, um, you know, we're all probably, you know, dependent upon a smartphone, as well as some kind of computer, you know, laptop, desktop, whatever. And I would wager to say that probably our tablets are kind of an icing on the cake. It may not be your primary. I know there's Ben Wilkoff and other early adapters out there who, you know, are, are, are trying to really go iPad only, but those folks are more outliers. So I think that we, we need to be considering what it is we're providing at school, the function that it's providing, the kind of, you know, lasting, um, you know, power and just the, I don't know what all, what you, what you call that, but, but it's efficiency, you know, it's, it's uh, uptime, all of that kind of stuff. And then thinking about how that's supplemented by devices that students have themselves. For instance, I probably don't need to provide camcorders for everybody in class because if I'm allowing students to bring phones, you know, they're going to have some capable cameras and capable video recording devices. Um, what I may need to provide, you know, might be more of a baseline of, you know, how do I get my curriculum? How do I get my content? Um, thinking about that. So those are some some thoughts. I think that's Exciting, and as we've said before, uh, it's a good thing to see Microsoft innovating and challenging in the space. It doesn't mean I'm ready yep. to transfer over there, but I think that's a positive. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, and I would say the um, the other piece here is that if batteries do become better, I think it's actually going to allow us to collapse down to less devices. One of the reasons why at one point I don't really carry a tablet that much with me anymore, but um, I used to carry multiple cell phones, right? Like the one that was my phone, the one that was like a portable media player, an Android portable media player that had, you know, movies on it so that when I was traveling, I didn't have to try to use my phone to do that and then, you know, lose battery life. But as, you know, if battery life becomes better, especially since that the, even, even a, a middle or a high low range Android phone now is more than good enough to play music and to play to play videos um, on on the run. Then it makes sense that this and a laptop uh, or this and maybe a modified tablet might be the only things I carry around with me. But a you know a three day old battery really is going to be the opportunity to do that along with wearables, right? Like these devices. One of the reasons why they're not as svelte as they could be is because they have to carry batteries with them. But you could see a world where a, a watch augmented reality glasses or any of the wearables that are starting to become more and more of a reality with technology, tiny, very effective batteries that you know run chipsets that are, are are very power sipping as opposed to power hungry, you know, you could see a lot of innovation that can come um, from all those pieces. So where to Absolutely. next, sir? Um, let's go down to the category that we've got under social media. And this is an article from a little while back, 11 November 2017, from The Guardian, how Facebook and Google threaten public health and democracy. Uh, this is an editorial, but um, I definitely would, would commend the, the Guardian to folks. I had an interesting conversation with one of the other presenters in Egypt who was from England about different sources and which ones um, Murdoch, you know, owns and controls and the, dif the different perspectives of, of – of the media sources there. Um, but the guardian definitely has some interesting perspectives. And this, uh, editorial is by Roger, uh, Mac McNamee. 
And he says, you know, the sad truth is Facebook and Google have behaved irresponsibly in the pursuit of massive profits, and this has come at a cost to our health. And so it goes back to articles we've discussed before about how social media is really designed to exploit the psychology of the slot machine and how, you know, these products, these platforms are addictive by nature and that you know, the implication here is that we're going to need regulatory intervention in order to protect the public, in order to protect protect our health. Now, I'm not going to politically go that far and be advocating that we all contact our congressmen to, to talk about this. We certainly have had that discussion here in the United States in our Congress in, in the last month when, you know, this was in the context of, of the Russian uh, intervention in, in the election and the, the uh, you know, PR, well, not PR. I think the law, the legal representatives of Facebook and Google and Twitter, you know, were were appearing before Senate committees and talking about things. But from a health standpoint, I think there's a very clear implication here for all of us that as we talk about wellness, we talk about digital citizenship, we talk about balance in our lives. We need to be acknowledging the addictive side of this. We need to check that in our own lives in terms of how much time we're you know, being sort of sucked into the screen and sucked onto the platform. I think we need to balance it, as I always try to say, with with the good, right? Not just portray it as all evil. Let's throw it all out and, and get rid of all of it. Um, but, um, you know, this is an interesting thing also to pose to kids. Like, well, what does this mean we should advocate for, you know, legislatively? Is Europe on on a better path or, a, or a, a, a further down the road than we are in the United States in terms of looking at regulatory, you know, um, uh, requirements for companies, and um, we've seen some interesting penalties actually in, in recent weeks uh, for uh, I think for for Google, um, for Apple, for taxes. We've seen di- you know different things, and that's not des- necessarily the same. But just where does regulation fit into this, right? Like that's a that's an important question. So, Jason, have you found yourself in the last let's say year? changing some of your behavior with respect to your own technology because you're recognizing the addictive nature of it or, or, or what you, what you, you know, stuff with, with the wife and, and all that. Or yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and this is probably a time to mention that I did a classroom 2.0 presentation related to this earlier this year on digital distraction, which is a topic I'm extremely interested in. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I I'm not going to claim that I, I found the magic tool. And in fact, my wife and I are constantly revisiting these topics because it's hard because these are, I mean, if, if you think technology is addictive and, and I, and I do very much believe that it is, then, you know, you're messing with fire a little bit here. Right. But um, some examples of things that I do, I, turned off the email notification for my work email on my phone. And the reason why is because, you know, almost like Pavlov's dog, I would uh, hear a notification for my email. I immediately go check it. And if it's 930 at night and it's it's a troubling email from work, which, you know, since I, I deal with, with a lot of students and parents, sometimes you do get an email that's not the most productive of tone. Um, the worst ones are actually the 12.30 a.m., uh, 12.30 a.m., 1.45 a.m. emails that you occasionally get. And um, there's just no way you can productively respond right away. And it's not like you're going to be able to let that go for five or six hours until you are at work to be able to deal with it. And I found that it was really disruptive, not just to my sleep, but to my personal life and to my family. And so I had to make changes related to that. So I don't get notifications for work email at all on my phone. And one of the things that I do strongly recommend the teachers do is learn about technology's controls that are built into the devices and utilize them so that you're not distracted. And um, I think that public health warning is an important one. Um, and, and part of the problem here is that, you know, I, I, I think it, and you mentioned this, I think, very uh, uh, astutely, West that, you know, we're not Luddites here, right? Like you're, uh, uh, well, recently someone called us pretty geeky and we are legit geeks, right? I mean, we, <laughs> you know, we, we know that, right? And I we're mean, proud I, of that. That was not a, you know, taken as a, you know, a put down. We're like, yeah, yeah baby. That's oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Pretty much like, yeah, I've, I've owned that the last 44 years or so. Um, and the, the bottom line for me is that I like, I love this stuff, 
but I know I've seen it. It can be incredibly disruptive and distracting. And so there's a balance issue here, right? Like I'd be the last person to say that we should ban that we should ban all cell phones from schools. I think that's 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 technophobic and the worst way. But at the same time, teachers should assert their their cleverness and authority to say now is not the time to have your phone out like welcome it bring it into your classroom but let's not use the phone for yeah. this or you know it's 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 a balancing act of orchestrating when to bring those technology devices in and out and there are times when i'm sorry that the the impulsive 15 year old isn't going to be able to control their impulses to check notifications and to answer text messages and so it's time for that device to go away for a while and i think that's part of education I just had a thought, you know, there are still some um, traditions and classes, um, I think in Lubbock, they were called cotillion, where, you know, kids um, that are maybe, maybe late middle school, early high school will learn to dance and they'll learn how to set the silverware. It's, mm -hmm. it's this thing of, you know, kind of getting ready to, you know, know your manners and stuff like that. I mean, that's something we probably need for the 21st century is helping both boys and girls discern, you know, yeah. with dating, how do you interact with text and what's too much and how do you, you know, gauge what you are sharing and what you're asking and how, you know, how much is too much contact uh, digitally. And when you're on the date, you know, and obviously this is something that <laughs> who's written the rules for this, right? But if, uh, if anybody gets that idea and runs with it and makes a company, you know, send, send Jason and I some Starbucks money. I think that is, um, something as the, the, the dad of two, you know, teenage daughters, um, and, and, and our son as well, who's doggone 20 years old, if you can believe that he's not a teenager anymore. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to help coach them, but it's, it's stuff that we didn't deal with in the same way that they're having to, they're having to figure it out. And it's, um, you know, it's important and, and we need to, to navigate this and to understand again, that we, I think we are becoming transhuman. We are becoming yeah. augmented. These devices are not small parts of our daily existence. They're a huge part of uh, what we think about, what, how we learn, and, and the way in which we have relationships with, with people. And so, you know, just like we would, would pay attention to something like, hey, I want you to know how to slow dance. I want you to know where to put your napkin and how to, you know, move your fork. I mean, you know, maybe that sounds silly, but hey, that that is important stuff in yeah. terms of, of life and where you go and whether you, you know, are able to navigate socially the expectations of different environments. We joke at our table sometimes, we're like, when you go to the White House, you know, we want to make sure you, you know, put your fork in the right spot and, and whatever. So I don't think that society has caught up with that yet. And that is definitely an avenue that, um, you know, kind of goes beyond what we're usually talking about as far as school implications. But there's a, right. there's a parenting side of that. And that that particular editorial is certainly one of the most in your face, you know, they're, you know, ruining our health by, you know, trying to exploit our attention. Right. Yep. Absolutely. So. All right. Where to next? We got oh. we started a little bit late, so we'll go a little little after the top, but we got sure. time for a few more. Um, I a couple of random notes related to entertainment. Um uh, kind of media news. First, Amazon Prime Video is now coming to Apple TV, which was kind of a long time piece. Um, what's really exciting about that is that uh, for those of you unaware of Amazon Prime Video, if you're an Amazon Prime buyer, right, so you're a member of that particular service, which is something I've been, uh, I've, I've purchased for you know, almost since the very beginning of Amazon Prime, there is a very impressive video service that comes along with that called Amazon Prime Video. It's it's uh, obviously known for its original shows. Uh, there are uh, uh, dozens of original shows, just like Netflix, um, Mozart in the Jungle, Transparent are, are two of the more primary examples of things that have been award-winning shows. But it's also a Netflix-style library of television shows and movies that you can access. And up until now, it's been difficult to get access to that library outside of an Amazon device. It was difficult, not impossible, but difficult to install it on an Android phone. Um, it was available on iOS, on the, on the iPad, and on the iPhone, but it wasn't available on the Apple TV. And now Amazon Amazon Prime Video is available on the Apple TV. You had to AirPlay, so you'd have the yes. Amazon service, you know, playing on your on your iPhone or, or on your uh, 
your iPad and then you'd have to flip it up there with AirPlay. That's huge because I had literally just this week read a Kevin Tofel editorial where he's like, where is it? They promised it by the fourth quarter. You know, we're almost out of, out of days in December. So that's huge. I'm glad to have you mention that. Thank you. Yep. And what's uh, exciting about that is that it means that if you uh, would like access to a lot of different media libraries, the Apple TV is a pretty sweet bargain for that because you have access to almost every major library now in the form of an application that you can download to that device, and it's it's pretty effortless. And say what you want about Apple, their uh, main TV screen experience is pretty unparalleled. I've utilized Fire TVs, which is a great cheap option. I've, I've played with Android TV devices before, which are okay, but it's pretty hard to beat even if you're not an apple person it's pretty hard to beat the apple tv for a great television experience and so um excellent excellent uh, uh article uh uh describing that and certainly a great piece of, of of movement forward um in that realm and then go ahead please no 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 you can do that and i'll segue to it afterwards go ahead um, and then there's also a very interesting article from The Guardian. This is from November 22nd. I just ran to it um, uh, today. It's talking about how, in general, the underground music scene does have a lot more opportunities with new media than it did previous to now. And one of the things that I think we talk a lot about is, is how new media has largely destroyed the music business, right? The, the heavy-handed tactics of Apple uh, during the uh, kind of rise of the iPod and their contracts with music providers for um, the iTunes store, that's all an interesting phenomenon. And I certainly think it's exposed, you know, I, I would say abuse maybe of record labels, right? But the bottom line is, is that, you know, the music industry is forever changed because of the iPod and what Apple did to the music industry. And a lot of people think that that change was for, for much worse, especially for artists. But some of the untold story is that, and this, I think this article does a great job of discussing this and talking about some of the pitfalls um, as well as advantages, is that if you are a you know less than commercial musician, if you don't have a lot of commercial viability, or at least you don't have an audience yet, there's extraordinary opportunities available to you publishing digitally now that just didn't exist 20 years ago. And so, you know, again, everything good and balanced, but I think it's a very interesting article. And if you want to know more about how independent artists or upstart artists or underground artists are utilizing digital tools to really contribute to culture, that article does a pretty good job of describing that process. So related to news about streaming media in your home, uh, Fortune Magazine on December 5th carried the article, Google lashes out at Amazon by blocking YouTube. And so um, while it's great to see Apple and Amazon, which it took, I think, Steve Cook talking, or not Steve Cook, I'm mixing Steve Jobs and, and um, um, Tim Cook. Tim Cook is uh, the CEO of Apple talking directly to the Amazon CEO, Jeff Bezos, in order to get the Amazon app on Apple TV. Uh, Google and Amazon are not having a similar experience working things out. And so Amazon has not been ready to sell, you know, Google's devices. And this is the, it's, it's interesting because with network neutrality, we've had these tech companies pushing net neutrality. And now we have carriers pointing at them saying, see, look at their bad behavior. They're not playing well with each other's, you know, platforms and devices. But because Amazon is refusing to sell, you know, Google Chromecast and the uh, Google Assistant devices, um, Google has responded initially. I think they were just defaulting people on an Amazon uh, like Fire Stick and those those tools to the mobile version of YouTube, which wasn't as great. And um, now they're just flat out going to block it. You know, starting in a couple weeks, they're giving people some warnings. And so um, I would yeah echo what you said as far as Apple TV had a very positive experience with it. Um, one of the things I find to just be wonderful, you know, using a smartphone of any kind. And, you know, Twitter or whatever social media you're using to find video, you know, when you play a video um, on your device and you're logged into your account, that immediately goes into your history. And so one of the ways that I end up, you know, looking at something up on the big screen is by having it on my iPad or my phone. It's in my history, and then I can use that Apple remote to just go to my account, look at history. Oh, look, there's that video, you know, and then be able to see that. There's the playlist to be able to view later, et cetera. But that's, a, that's also just become an important 
uh, element of how I consume media and, and get information. And tied to that also with uh, Google News is the article from BuzzFeed on December 4th, here's what YouTube is doing to stop its child exploitation problem. And so basically they're saying that uh, YouTube, and they project this is, a, I think, a fourfold increase, is going to have over 10,000 content moderators on staff by the end of next year in 2018. The CEO of YouTube, who is Susan uh, Wojcicki, I don't know how to actually pronounce her name, um, made that announcement. And so there's some pretty bizarre things, right, that are happening on YouTube. And, and part of this, I heard somebody a number of years ago say, you know, the more people that get online – the more online is going to look like the world. And there's all kinds of folks doing all kinds of things out there. But um, YouTube uh, reports that it's using machine learning today to remove more than 150,000 videos or that it has uh, since June. And if they had done that effort by hand, it would have taken 180,000 people working 40-hour weeks. And so, um, you know, they say that, but in October, the 83% of its videos removed for extremist content were originally flagged by machine learning. Just one month later, it says the number is 98%. So we talk about AI, machine learning, which are not the same thing, but they're similar. You know, algorithmic capability to identify patterns is huge. And so it's, but it's not enough. And it's important that we still have human judgment. And I'm glad to see YouTube addressing this. And the last little YouTube-related article I'll mention is in that same series. This is from Wired on December the 1st. Google, Amazon find not everyone is ready for artificial intelligence. And what the article basically says is that the folks at these companies are now, um, you know, hiring themselves out to help, you know, companies use artificial intelligence. And that, that, then it's in short supply, right? They do not have enough computer engineers who understand machine learning and AI and can utilize these things. And so uh, we got to find ways to help excite and capture the imagination of students so that they could potentially, you know, have, have these kinds of skills because they are very, very relevant and very needed. So, Jason, how are you on the overall Google Kool-Aid, I drink it, I love it, I'm scared of it, I run from it. You know, where are you on that continuum today? And and do any of the things we, we talk about and, and discuss on a weekly basis, you know, has that moved you on that spectrum at all in the last, you know, few months? Um, I, I would say that I, I'm a pretty big uh, Google Kool-Aid drinker, uh, and I have been maybe since the start. I mean, when I first installed, um, I'm sorry, when I first used the Google search engine in 1998 and saw how how differently they approached a, a lot of things related to the internet, I felt like this had to be the future of the way we would look at the internet. And as it turns out, more often than not, Google has, has really... Um, I guess enhanced my internet use more than it's detracted from it. But you know, the bottom line is, you know, we don't just need kids to go into computer engineering to build this stuff. We need kids to go into computer engineering so they can help us understand this, right? One of the problems I think we have is that because we don't have enough people that are able to staff startups, be able to take jobs that are unique in these uh, philosophers, for example, those that are really thinkers and uh, sociologists and psychologists that have also a computer science background. That's part of the reason why some of these tools get unleashed upon us and that we become essentially digital guinea pigs. And having more people that have experience in understanding and engaging in these processes, I think is a really important piece uh, to kind of help you know, protect ourselves in society. And um, you know, I, I, I trust Google, and I know that people think I'm an idiot for saying that sometimes. Um, I, I got called out on uh, Twitter a couple of weeks ago because I have a Google Home in my home, and I talk about it as being a good, relatively positive thing in my house. Um, but I have to put trust into Google for that. Now, I do happen to think that there is a lot of economic reason why Google is likely to continue to earn my trust, right? Like Google has a ton of information, 
but they're also one of the few companies that puts out extraordinary amounts of tools to let me see my information, take my information out of their systems if I wish, and then um, start to tweak the way my world interacts with their systems, whereas the vast majority of tools I, th that I'm logged into, and I would include things like a lot of uh, uh, merchants that I, I regularly engage with, don't give me that, that same power and, and, and set of tools. So, uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot to all of this, obviously. We don't really understand um, uh, big data in, in and machine learning like we need to. I think AI is still very much emerging from a, a cognizant standpoint, but the only way we're really gonna be able to understand that, I think, is to get more human beings as part of the conversation. Yep, absolutely, I, I agree. So, uh, I think we'll do one, I'll do one more, and if you wanna do another one before Geeks of the Week, um, there's a Quartz article from November 29th called the U.S. could be on the verge of dismantling digital privacy as we know it. And uh, since we have had a few weeks, I, I guess I should have probably checked to see if we've got this ruling. I don't think the Supreme Court, I think they, they give their rulings later. So they're going to hear all this stuff. And then I think we hear about their rulings. Um, but from the article, it says the tension between security and privacy is a perennial question for the U.S. Supreme Court, and its latest incarnation comes in the form of Carpenter versus U.S., which it, the high court is hearing arguments on for November 29th. The case, which hinges on whether the government needs a warrant based on probable cause to see your cell phone location data, could have far-reaching implications on consumer privacy in the digital age. And so... Again, as we've talked about on the show at various times, privacy is a really important thing to be talking about, to helping students be aware of, um, and also just for us to be tracking as citizens. And so I think that, um, you know, is is something for us to watch. And I don't, I don't know whether, you know, the degree to which we can advocate at this point is pro is minimal, right? Because we're just going to be watching to to see what the justices do. Um, I do know that we're waiting to see what's happening with net neutrality. Uh, and we don't have any articles, I don't think, this week really about that. I, we're still expecting the FCC, aren't we, uh, here in a week so, yes. to basically dismantle. And and I think what we do need to be be contacting our representatives about, and I'm not going to be very hopeful about this, is for Congress to take action. Because when the Obama administration through the FCC created, um, you know, in in uh, not in law, but in whatever code, you know, Title II applying to data, this was not done through the U.S. Congress. This was done, you know, via appointed officials. And so now we have appointed officials who are saying they're going to be reversing this. So, Jason, any thoughts about the dismantling of digital privacy or the net neutrality stuff? Well, I, I'm obviously awaiting that decision. I'm pretty sure it's, it's going to go in, in against what, what I think we have advocated for um, in, in continuing to protect net neutrality. I will say, however, that I have read a number of articles in the last two weeks to suggest that it's not like net neutrality is going to die immediately on the vine. It would then take digital providers, internet providers, to then start offering services that do essentially violate uh, net neutrality. And there's still plenty of opportunities for Congress to step in and provide a regulatory framework for net neutrality. I'm, I'm not particularly hopeful either. I did email um, a, both of, of Montana senators, and we have a lone representative in the House of Representatives in, in tiny uh, Montana, of course, I mean, tiny population Montana. Um, and the, the one I heard back from, I know one of my senators is for maintaining net neutrality. Um, I think our representative is against maintaining neutrality and net neutrality. And, and the senator that emailed me back basically said that he supports the FCC chair in his decision. So um, that's not and if we're in a, you know in order to maintain innovation, which I, I thought was was a pretty suspect argument. But um, yeah, I, I I you know I don't think this one one thing that's going to be kind of a downfall here is that we're not going to see like digital apocalypse here. It's not like the day after. You know your your private uh, uh, you know blog is going to get no traffic anymore because it's 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 not on the internet fast lane and you know Netflix only will be the only thing you can get in your house. It's not going to be like that, but it is going to change the face of the internet if these internet service providers step in and do crappy things. What is actually changing traffic to your blog and certainly is pride of mine is if you haven't switched over to HTTPS because Google has said, you know, they are downgrading you in their SEO search engine optimization algorithms 
uh, if you're not doing encryption. And I'm not on my WordPress sites. That's one of the things I need to, to take on. Um, this also reminds me that I watched more C-SPAN last Friday night than I probably ever have in my life as that tax bill was going. And, you know, even tweeted my senators, who I'm sure were not monitoring their Twitter feeds at all. Um, but, oh my gosh, do we ever need to, um, if not reinvent, certainly help constructively evolve our democracy, our Republican form of government. You know, when, when senators are given a, what, 589-page uh, tax bill you know, two hours prior to the vote. I mean, this is just what we did see with Obamacare, where all these folks had not, you know, read the legislation. It was written by lobbyists and, you know, just kind of kind of ugly. So is there an ed tech thing in there? Uh, certainly, it was kind of, it was good, it was cool to follow some hashtags and to see what some other people were thinking and, and kind of be connected in that way. Um, you know, watching C-SPAN, because I, I wasn't the only one, you know, tuning in to, to see that. I mean, when did they leave? It was like 2 a.m. or something like that, East Coast time. It was crazy, right? So anytime senators are staying, you know, in the, in the chamber until after 2 a.m., passing a landmark piece of legislation that may change everyone's life, you know, who's a taxpayer in the country, um, you know, it just, when, when we look at what we can do with technology and we look at, that situation, it uh, you know, makes me makes me think we need to figure out how to do better. So perhaps Jason, you can you can get on that proposal and uh, you know get get that out there so Montana can lead the way. Yep, I'll I'll, I'll right when we're done here is when I'll I'll, I'll make that change. So excellent. Any uh, last articles you want to do before we geek of the weekend? Yeah, uh, this one's a, a you know not a super interesting um, uh, piece of of big news, but uh, the big winners on Cyber Monday. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Samsung Android tablets uh, were a big seller on uh, Black Friday, Cyber Monday sales. I mean, the typical stuff, Apple does well on those two days. Um, Amazon does well on those two days. Um, but apparently Chromecast and Android tablets by Samsung. And the reason why I think this is so interesting is because um, I've actually only owned owned one Android tablet in my history of being an Android user. I had a Nexus 7 tablet uh, when those first came out just because I wanted to learn Android. And I liked it, but it had about two years of shelf life before it became unbearably slow as it started kind of going through the update cycle. And I I'd never looked back. Like a, a, a an iPad for a tablet experience, it's pretty hard to beat the iPad. And now I have an iPad and then I have one of the, the super cheap, like, you know, $39 uh, Fire tablets running around here somewhere that I, I literally... It's a hack device for me, right? I like to hack what, things on. What do you What do you think of that? I've not even picked one of those up, really. So, um, it so. it this was I think it was it was either forty nine dollars or sixty nine dollars. I can't remember two years ago, and it's it's fine. And the reason why it's fine is because it well, first of all, it was, it was dirt cheap, and then I I found an article in about 30 seconds that allowed me to put the Google Play Store on and then replace the launcher and is effectively an Android tablet. And it's fine for what it is, right? Like I can watch Netflix on it. It's got a low resolution screen. Um, I was this close to purchasing one of the 10 inch uh, full HD Fire tablets for $100 on Cyber Monday. But I decided that um, you know, once you have you know, 145 screens in your house, you have to you have to draw a line somewhere, right? But um, it's it's a it's a good enough experience, right? It worked just fine, and I think that's that's what's interesting to me is I don't know anyone with an Android tablet. Like I literally don't know anyone, and I they don't I tell they nerds. don't tell people they don't talk. About that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the problem. It's like the first rule about Android tablets is you don't talk about Android tablets, and. Um, you know that that's 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 a message to me. So I thought that was interesting. That Chromecast, I'm not surprised about because they're you know it's a thirty dollar investment that allows you to throw tons of digital signals on your television. But it was a surprise to me that the Samsung Android tablets were a hit um, on Cyber Monday. So just a little consumerism. It is the season, and uh, you know some interesting pieces uh, related to what sold on those two kind of commercial holidays. Very good. Well, where would you like to uh, have us 
spend some of our money or some of our attention with your Geek of the Week this week? Well, um, uh, Wes did throw Night in the Night on there, which is a, a super easy way to install many free applications on Windows. And if you type the words Nanite Alternative for Mac, I've used, I can't name one off the top of my head, but I've used one on Mac before too. So there there are lots of applications that allow you to install, you know, all your browsers and your free programs that you install on a fresh computer. But the other thing I want to point out, um, because uh, Wes is a new Android user, and in fact, I've, I've worked with a couple of new Android users the last couple of weeks one of the things that's true about an android phone that's that is that is not as much of the case um, on a lot of iphones is that you do need to be more mindful of battery because the the power to modify your platform means that you can oftentimes install applications that might be you know, eating a lot of, of battery life without you wanting or knowing it and as an example of this my dad who's an android user his first smartphone was an android phone it was uh, three years ago, and it's still going strong. Um, he had installed a bunch of applications, including ones that claimed to clean up his system that just introduced new uh, battery-using malware that was serving up advertisements to his phone. And we wiped his phone and started over again, and his battery life went from six hours to well over 24 hours which with the way he was using the phone. But there's a really great article that I want to um, point our listeners to. This article is kind of a how-to article for make use of, which is a kind of a great, um, almost um, uh, life hacker-like uh, website that focuses on more of the kind of techie side of, of, of life hacks. But it's basically a, a beginner's guide to, to battery life on Android. And the idea here is that some of the things you can put into play, some of the practices you can use to save battery life. It includes getting rid of battery hog apps, uh, being mindful about the brightness of your screen, and utilizing some of the features built right into Android for saving battery life. And so that's a great article. Um, again, it'll be in our show notes, edtechsr.com. And if you are new to Android, or if you've really never thought about what you can do to be more cautious about battery life, because you're like me and carry around 35 pounds of battery packs, um, then you may want to consider doing this if for no other reason than it'll make your pack lighter. And before I share my Geek of the Week, I'll just comment that uh, what I do with an article like that, because I don't, obviously don't have time to read that right now, is <clears throat> I use Pocket, phenomenal uh, platform and tools. So just click that little browser extension in Chrome, save that for reading later, click the Flip It uh, bookmarklet that I have to flip that over into my iReading magazine over on Flipboard. And then sometimes I'll end up actually, you know, sharing it via Twitter. So just kind of some of the stuff. And and I am loving, by the way, the 240 character Twitter limit. We were, you know, kind of negative. I was about, oh, it's, you know, getting away from the old ways, how we started in 2006 or seven. But, uh, you know, going to Egypt, uh, being at the conference, um, just, you know, wanting to share more and not having to spend quite as much time figuring out how to how to make things smaller and just, just having more room. I've, I've really enjoyed that. It's, it yeah. hasn't, to me, you know, been a negative. So my Geek of the Week is a bit risky because I have not read it, although I have ordered it. Um, it is a novel by Eric C., uh, Luthart. It is called Red Devil 4, and he is the neurosurgeon whose article I was citing earlier talking about all the ways um, that he's going to, he is working to connect our brains to the internet, and he's the founder of this Neurolutions uh, uh, company. So this is a 2014 novel that he has written. You can pick it up uh, used on hardcover for just uh, $3.90 with about $4 of shipping <clears throat> from third-party um, uh, folks. And it says that Red Devil 4 is a spine-tingling techno-thriller based on cutting-edge research from surgeon and inventor Eric C. Luthart. And I would point out, as we've mentioned on the show, that many times science fiction is you know, highly informed by the cutting edge of of what is possible today with science and what those who are are living on that future edge and seeing into the future project we're going to be experiencing. And so I, uh, I'm going to get that before Christmas, and that may be one of my holiday reads. So I also put underneath uh, our, our links for tonight um, the already mentioned – no, no, this wasn't um, – 
Amazon transcribe. I don't know. Did you see this, Jason? This this is kind I, of I saw cool. the headline. It's interesting. Yeah. So that's in preview, and I've went ahead and put in a request. I, I said that like, what's your monthly request? Um, Amazon Transcribe is a sophisticated AI-driven transcription service, so that when you have media like MP3, WAV, FLAC, whatever your formatted audio files or video files, Amazon is going to use its AI machine learning mojo to do a very sophisticated transcription that is supposedly pretty accurate for punctuation as well. And the preview is either in English or Spanish. And like, let's go down the road with this because what this potentially means <laughs> from a scary standpoint is if I've talked about, you know, foil hat kind of things and I put my transcriptions on, then I'll be searchable, you know, in a way that I'm not today. Um, but I, but this is going to be kind of cool. And if hopefully I get accepted, I will, you know, do, do some transcriptions and we'll uh, take a look at that because, you know, we are, of course, hopefully one of the finer podcasts that you'll find online, but we're not having anybody transcribe our set, our our uh, shows like you have for Twit and you know other kinds of shows that are making them you know much more accessible for folks who are hearing impaired. And so, thinking about not only transcribing into English, but let's think about what that would be translated into Arabic, let's say, or you know uh, Russian, or you know just some other language that we don't have the capability ourselves to do Chinese, you know. Um, one of the, the languages of India. Pretty amazing. So we have definitely gone a little bit longer in tonight's show, but we uh, hope that you have benefited and would love to hear from you if any of what we've talked about has stimulated your own thinking. Jason, how can people reach out to you? And uh, are you going to be doing any any blogging or sharing of, of digital ideas over the holidays? Yeah, I am Tech Savvy Teach on Twitter, and I blog for the Northwest Council for Computer Education via the Tech Savvy Teacher blog, blog.ncc.org. And I got a lot of a lot of smaller articles I'm working on right now. One of the things I'm trying to figure out is, well, uh, first I um, have been inspired um, to take one of my, maybe my older Android phones and turn it into a Microsoft phone. There's a lot of articles about how to do this now, but because um, Edge is available as an Android app now, and there's an excellent launcher, Google, I'm sorry, Android. Android launcher by Microsoft that integrates well into their systems. I might play around with that a little bit and maybe report some of my findings. If you are in a Office 365 district, for example, and you find that that your Android Android phone's not providing you enough connection to those tools so that you can really use use your your cell phone as a power tool, um, as a teacher in an Office 365 district, I want to be able to learn more and do some guidance on that. So um, probably um, some blogging um, or at least some sharing on social media. Uh, in the near future. And then I'm also working on a longer project that I've been kind of uh, tweaking a bit in a Google Doc that I like to make formal is, is, is setting up the Chrome browser to be an online student. And that's something I'll publish via Medium. Um, and the idea is, is that I want to share some of the power tips that I utilize to use the Chrome browser as an online school administrator in order to share with students ways that I set up things to be, you know, very efficient in dealing with, you know, dozens of systems and upwards of, of dozens of tools in order to be productive um, when I sit down every day at my desk at work. What about you, Wes? I want to commend to our listeners your excellent um, series or just document of Chrome um, applications and extensions. I had an opportunity last week to visit with all of our learning specialists and resource teachers at our school and definitely pulled upon that to share those resources. And so that is awesome. Um, I'm available on Twitter at W Fryer. My blog is speedofcreativity.org. Been doing a little bit more blogging slightly and a, and a little bit more podcasting. Um, and over the holiday, hopefully in addition to getting my uh, blogs moved over to a secure HTTPS environment, we'll end up sharing a few more things as well. So we are going to reach out at least to Eric Langhorst. We need to, if we want to do an end of your show, we've kind of made that a tradition. We haven't talked uh, schedules yet, but we'll probably, you know, sometime after Christmas, before New Year's, maybe after, but right around there, we'll do an end of year show, kind of looking at the the year in ed tech. Um, may reach out to, to another guest, possibly. That's sometimes fun to have three or four of us. And thank you for tuning into the show. Remember, you can get all of our show notes at edtechsr.com slash links. You can download 32 kilobit audio MP3 versions, as well as about just a little under 200 megabyte um, 
360p mp4 versions and you can always subscribe to us on youtube as well we are edtechsr on twitter and the hashtag edtechsr will find its way to us we would love to hear from you any feedback that you've got or if you've got suggestions for the show our chrome show and defense of all things chromebook is still in the works not sure if that will be coming to you in 2017 or 18. But until next time, we encourage you to stay savvy and be safe. And don't be afraid of that moniker geek because you know what? It's just cool to be able to do powerful things with information and ideas. And certainly the tools we have today let us do that. So thanks for tuning in. <laughs>